This is a sneak peek. Nobody gets this. I'll show you what it, I'll show you that truck that day. Yeah. You want to hear that? Yeah. Okay. Will it pick it oh, up? Oh, wait, wait, wait. This is, we're about to hear the recording this is the original. of what you recorded in your truck. This is yeah, January 29th, 2021 in my truck. I came from the mud. There's on my What's up, guys? I'm here to tell you this episode is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a new, fast-growing, tech-enabled, well-capitalized, community-powered alternative to traditional health insurance. Founded by Andy Schoonover, a proven founder and entrepreneur with a successful track record, including a $100 million-plus exit. By the way, Andy's been on this podcast in the past. CrowdHealth uses the power of crowdfunding, member ratings, unlimited choice and huge cash pay discounts to provide a simple considerably less expensive solution to managing your medical bills crowd health gives you full agency and sticks with you no matter where you move or what jobs you take on you've heard of big pharma but you may not know big insurance is actually the man behind the curtain with 12 of the last 15 heads of the FDA taking jobs in big pharma and 64 percent of its funding coming from private industry don't hold your breath waiting for the government to save the day. It's safe to say our system's broken. It's time to take your well-being into your own hands, and CrowdHealth helps you do just that. You'll pay into your individual account monthly, and if you ever want to leave, you'll simply pay a $250 closing fee, and they will return the entire balance in your account to you because it's your account. Because it's crowdfunded, we all have a vested interest in each other's health. They even cover up to $300 a year in routine wellness visits. So far, for every $100 members have paid into their accounts, an average of only $30 has been paid out. So you can expect to see your money grow in your account over time. Take that, big insurance. Join today by visiting joincrowdhealth.com and using the promo code KLP to pay only $99 a month for the first three months. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code KLP. Joincrowdhealth.com, get you some. So I have, um, this was March 6th of 2020. Here's a headline on Billboard. Ryan Fowler leads Christian producers chart fueled by hits for Rhett Walker and Toby Mac. Ryan, when, Brian, when? This was March of 2020. Okay. March 6, right. 2020. Brian Fowler rises to number one on Billboard's Christian producers chart ruling for the first time. Thanks to five songwriting credits on the latest hot Christian song. So my question to you, Brian Fowler is, are you the top Christian <laughs> music producer right now? I don't know about right now. It, it fluctuates for sure. How often does that fluctuate? You know, I, I, I feel like it ebbs and flows. I mean, uh, there's a, a group of people that kind of, I don't know, every two years, three years, you'll you'll have your name pop up there, which okay. is fun. Yeah. Like, the, like the chart it's referring to there, is that does that change weekly or monthly or what's the... That chart that? changes weekly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so you'll have, you know, a bunch of things just kind of snowball and end up kind of towards the top. How many times have you been number one? producer in the Christian music genre? Probably three. Three yeah. separate times? Yeah. Okay. How, when was the first time? I think that was the first time. Oh, probably. okay. So yeah. three times since 2020. Well, actually, you know, that might have been the second time. I think there's been a third since then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like, is it the type of thing that snowballs? Like if it happened once and then it happens again, there's a greater likelihood of it happening again or doesn't it work that way? I don't, I don't know. I mean, okay. it just depends because I think some people, um, they'll kind of, rise up really quickly okay and then they'll just kind of fall off and it's like you have a big hit and then it goes away but i mean the goal is that it would happen consistently yeah you know so for a producer for that to happen it's a byproduct of the song doing well yeah. correct yeah. that's the only way that that's going to happen is yeah. the songs that you're involved with do really well yeah and that's reflect because that was billboard radio was that what that was it was billboard yeah so that's yep. just reflective of radio songs so that doesn't okay. take into account anything in like you know, churches or anything like that. Okay. So it's a, it, it's a pretty like, I mean, it is a good lens into what's happening 
in the in the industry, but mm-hmm. it is a narrow lens. I guess gotcha. if that makes, that makes sense. sense. Do you was that satisfying to you, <laughs> or was this like a goal that you had, or do you not care about any of that stuff, and you're just doing your work? Like I'm sure. I'm sure you want yeah. you want your songs to be heard, which means yeah. a lot of people are going to listen to them, which leads to stuff like that. Yeah. But is that like a driving force or? I, I wouldn't say it's a driving force. I mean, it's enjoyable when it happens for sure. It's really fun. Um, but I think you're immediately kind of met with the like, what's next uh, thought or, or just like, oh gosh, I have it this week. Am I going to have it next week? Or like, okay. You know, and then when it goes away, you, you, you kind of always measure yourself based on your past successes yeah in a way which is really funny um but it it was never a goal uh to have that okay i mean it was it was it was a goal to have songs that people liked okay so what is next after something like that (laughs) like what are the other things that a music producer could get um credits for you know you you can you can get nominated for things grammys dev awards stuff like that yeah Yeah. okay Um, yeah different shows um question for you well, let me ask this. Do you write any, do, do you write songs and produce only in the Christian music space or other also? Yeah. I, just I've, Christian? Yeah. I've done some TV film stuff just kind of randomly and then like a country thing. But, but okay. I mean, uh, 99.9% of what I do is intentionally in the Christian genre. And yeah. it's always been like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So do you think of music as being... So coming from that perspective, then, do you think of music as being able to be divided into two sort of categories, Christian and non-Christian? Or do you think of it in terms of pop, rock, hip hop, Christian, jazz? You know what I mean? I think I think you have um, I was talking to TJ about this the other day, because I think in his mind, everything belongs to God. Yep. You know, so any expression is 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 uh he's the ultimate creator, you know, we're just expressing things and he, he owns it all. So in his mind, everything's not, everything's Christian Mm. music, but you know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, I think there's a definite divide, um, between what is maybe like sacred. Uh, there's a reverence to that. There's a, there's an intentionality to that. And then things that are just commercial and pop, you know, pop, Mm -hmm. I, I just did a a long, um, kind of course on my method of songwriting And one of the biggest points that I make is anything that's um, pop music, it's popular, it's meant to be replaced. It's meant to be popular in a moment Mm -hmm. and then be replaced by the next popular thing. I think when you're writing something that I would put under the banner of like Christian music, the the goal in my mind is to create something that is um, not trend oriented, Mm -hmm. uh, something that's timeless um, to create in the way that God creates from an eternal perspective, you know, he creates in seasons and rhythms and patterns, but he doesn't create in trend. And so to me, I think that's a goal that I keep in mind is, is what is something that is going to speak <coughs> to people in 200 years yep. and today yep. and could have spoken to somebody 200 years ago. Now, maybe they're not going to um, gravitate towards the style of like playing or mm-hmm. the sonic space that it's in or whatever. But I think, I think that really um, what makes it Christian is the lyric. Yes. To me, you yes. know, it's not the music, although I think music is a tool that can be helpful, melody and rhythm and all that. Yes. Well, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was thinking in terms of the only thing that would be different between Christian music and non-Christian music would be the lyrics themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. So that, that's, there's, there's that. Oh, and but, then but, I, th- I think to add to that too, which is funny, I think a lot of people um, assume that you can just take any lyric that you could call a Christian lyric and put it on any track. And I don't think that's true because I think, I think music informs emotion so much. Uh And so like, you know, I've had, (laughs) I've had A&Rs tell me before, like, Hey, I want you to do a song that sounds like, you know, this Maroon 5 song or something like that. In the Christian music space? In the Christian music space. And it's like, man, the reference that you're giving me is a song about sex Mm -hmm. and it sounds sexy. Mm -hmm. Like it, it evokes that emotion. So if you took that type of track and then you just put like a lyric on it that's about Jesus, all of a sudden you have this really odd, disjointed thing that someone could call Christian music, but I think it's a really poor expression. You know what I mean? I do, yeah. So the music, the melody, the notes, the lyrics aside, the music yeah. itself, it it is that, it can convey that much 
of a message all on its own? A hundred percent. I mean, any soundtrack to any movie that you watch. I think there's a reason sure. those course, yeah, melodies right. and rhythms are chosen, you know, and a lot, I've got some buddies that do a lot of cinematic stuff and it's just like the way the drums sound mm -hmm. is scary. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like the hit is just like intense. And, and before ever seeing footage, you're already there, you know, what's happening. Oh, it's like a jailbreak yes. scene or somebody, you know, whatever, like some monsters coming around the corner or whatever. And, and there are sounds that sound like things are happening. Um, and so that, that I think is a really useful tool, but, yeah. but I think it can also be really harmful. So that's an extreme or that's a very good example is like these sounds and a soundtrack in a movie yeah. and how they can convey emotion. I think everyone can relate with that. Yeah. But you're saying that same thing can be happening in a more non-obvious way or a more totally. subtle way yeah. with a Maroon 5 song that yeah. not the casual listener may not have been thinking. Yeah. Because I think if I would you know, be listening to that song that you're talking about, you know, there would be the lyrics there. But aside from that, I think I'd be probably thinking, you know, whether I like that, that groove or not, or that, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. song or that the music or not. Yeah. I don't know if I would be thinking about like, okay, that music is, that's sexy music. Totally. But you're saying that's, that's a thing. <laughs> I think there's like a subconscious yeah, yeah. thing that goes on. Yeah. I yeah. see that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's so, it's an interesting art form. Cause it's not like a color palette when you're painting, you know what I mean? Like, like there's so many colors to choose from. They do to a degree evoke certain emotions, but depending on how you use them, I mean, you can create any, any piece. Right. But with music, it's like, there are, I don't know. It's, it's more than just the colors that you're choosing. It's almost like you're choosing this palette or this kind of landscape scene and you're putting things on that. And so it's just, I don't know. I feel like it informs you like before you even hear a lyric. Okay, I talk talk. Say that another way, because I don't think I understood what you were saying. The difference between having like a color palette. And, yeah. And so music. like color palette would be like okay, you've got all these instruments to choose from. Yep. So in that way, it's the same. But like I think when you take a an already crafted song, and you say I want to apply a new lyric to an emotion that's already been expressed. Mm -hmm. It's like painting on top of the Mona Lisa. Right. It is the Mona Lisa. You're just oh, you're sure. gonna see that no matter what you do. Yeah. So it's you might be using all the same tools, but you're using somebody else's arrangement of those tools. Uh huh. And that that carries with it its own unique expression. That, if that makes, makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in a very real sense, it's like two things are true at once. Yeah. The A chord is an A chord, no yeah. matter what song it's in. Totally. So it's not. Yeah. Like there's a Christian A chord. Yeah. But in another also real sense is like it's more than the lyrics on a Christian song. Yeah. Because the lyrics is conveying one part of the message and everything else is conveying another part of the message. And what you're trying to do as a songwriter is convey a whole message. Totally. So at yeah. some level you can't really separate the lyric and the music. I don't think you can. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I think, I think, you, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people about it that disagree with me um, who, who just, you know, think anything kind of goes, but I think, I think you are informing people and I think it really uh, plays a role uh, in younger people. I just know for me growing up, like the, the music that I was listening to that was Christian was kind of just like a version of a, of a already popularized thing. So it'd be like, Hey, if you like Blink-182, right. you'll like this band. You're right. You like, that was very common. Yeah. You know, Slipknot or what, I don't even know if there's a Christian equivalent to yeah. that, but it, whatever, like there's like this version of that thing over here. And it's almost like what, you, what you're really thinking about is the other thing. Yes. But then there's these Christian lyrics. And so it's just, it feels kind of like odd together, you know? Yes. Um, whereas I think, I think um, you can have Christian songs that are not like doxology and like, you know, it, they don't have to be a hymn to be a, a Christian song. But I do think the emotion that you bring with the melodies and the music is mm -hmm. important for sure. Yeah. That is... I don't think I ever heard anyone say it like that, but that explains the Christian music. I was born in 84, so mm -hmm. the 90s, you know, um, the early 2000s. Yeah. The Christian music that I was listening to then, which the way I was raised, even listening to a lot of the Christian music at that time was sort of like a no-no. 
Um, like, you, you know, like I, I they use I, amplifiers. Uh, yeah. You are not allowed. This wasn't exactly true in my household. <laughs> Mom was kind of chill with it. I think she would yeah. have been fine with us listening to DC talk or whatever. But yeah. like back then you couldn't just listen to that anywhere in, mm-hmm. in the way I, yeah. I, would, I grew up. But you are right is they were taking a sound and yeah. using that same sound totally. and changing the lyrics. And it it didn't exactly work yeah. if you were a fan of music. Totally. Well, I think a, a prime example, and I'm dear friends with the guy, and so he probably hate that I'm even saying this, but it's I think it's someone something that I've heard from a lot of people, and it's been you know talked about or whatever. You've got Nirvana, smells like Teen Spirit, and you've got DC Talk, Jesus Freak, and they're very very similar musically, yeah. and they're both at like this kind of like rebellion song, mm-hmm. and you feel that yes. in the drum fill that comes into that song, yes. and the way the guitars rock through it, and so yes, it's totally like this Jesus Freak anthem thing. But it's really like a rebel's anthem. Mm. And so you're getting that kind of rebellious attitude from yes. the from the first hit. And that's the same thing you get in Smells Like Teen Spirit. It's like a very similar passion. Mm-hmm. You've just you've just put a different lyric. And it worked in that sense because that's what they were trying to do. Mm-hmm. But I think I think when you um yeah. I I think culture has shifted so much so and like church music especially has has tried to stay like relevant and cool and hip and all the things whereas i don't know that felt like a little bit more of an honest expression if that makes sense yeah I don't yeah know. it does now do you if you basically 99.9 percent of your work as a songwriter and producer yeah um well and as an artist too right i mean you're just involved in a lot of different areas here with the music but mm-hmm. if you're if your involvement or your creation of the music is 99.9 percent christian yeah. Do you listen to only Christian music, a lot of Christian music? That's a good question. What's your mix there on the cons- consuming side or enjoyment side? I'm odd in that way. Um, I don't listen to much music, really at all. Um, I listen to what I'm working on <laughs> just because I, I have to because I'm just trying to get things right and, and kind of suss it out. Um, my wife and I listen to like Louis Armstrong and we'll put on like 40s music just randomly or like the father of the bride soundtrack or whatever, just like kind of light stuff in the background or it's like cold play um, or like city of light. I think those are the places we kind of gravitate that Shane and Shane and the Gettys. I mean, it kind of fluctuates between those worlds. Maybe, okay. maybe John Mayer essentials every now and then. Okay. But Is I city like of light Christian city of light. Yeah. I'm just yeah. Yeah. There it's a worship team out in Australia. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They do like modern hymns um, similar to the, to the Gettys, but a little more maybe contemporary sounding. So you don't listen to a ton, a whole ton of music? I don't, no. I mean, I used to all the time until oh, I really? started doing it professionally. Okay, and yeah. then so is that because <coughs> it's work to you now when you hear this music? It's like it's like put you in a, puts you in a workspace? I or? think subconsciously I don't want to get ideas from other people. Uh-huh. I think I just want to have ideas come to me. Sure. And so if I'm listening to a bunch of music, like, I mean, I used to check like all the new release Friday stuff and everything that's coming out. And then I'd, I'd want to be like kind of up to date on like what's current, what's happening, how can I compete? Um, but then you just find yourself copying things that you've heard mm-hmm. because you're influenced by it. And that's not all bad. Um, but I kind of like having like my high school years <laughs> as my influence okay, and just letting that be. And oh, then kind of just, just building off of that. Like what it was naturally me when I was just it, like formative years, figuring out who I am and the good, the bad, the ugly. Like yeah. what are all the things that just pulled at me? Um, you know, because music was so huge. In, I, well, music was huge in my life. One, I, I had a massive season of depression uh, in like middle school, high school. Mm. And a lot of that, like music was a big catalyst for that. And it was, it was, I would find my, I don't know, like, I would listen to music and be sad and listen to music and be sad and just hate myself. And so like, it was a very like bad cycle that I was so on. It wasn't helpful. No, saying? it was terrible. Oh, it was so unhelpful, which is why I think I'm so passionate about what music evokes because I really think it can play into your emotional state in a huge way. Yes, it can. You know, um, that's why, you know, you go to raves and you get high and you mm-hmm. just check out. It's like, that's yep. a, that's a feeling you're getting from the music, you know? Yep. Um, life's awesome for about four hours. Life's awesome for four <laughs> hours. And then it's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so like uh, knowing what things struck a chord with me, um, good and bad, I think is helpful. 
Um, and so trying to kind of avoid certain things or maybe lean into certain things or go, man, this thing made me feel a certain way back then. But if I could use that for good, mm -hmm. it'd be really helpful or really powerful. You know, now I thought what you were going to say was in your season of depression as a teenager, that music was something that you held on to that helped you get through that. But it was a, it was a little bit of both. Yeah. But okay. I would say a lot of the depression was brought on and then it like kind of compounded by the music I was listening to. Okay. And then, and it was around that time that I really got introduced to like Christian, like worship music, like contemporary worship music. Mm. Um, we had started going to a church and they were playing like Hillsong United and all the things that were popular back then. And, mm -hmm. and that was the first time I'd heard that type of music. And so up to that point, it was like, I heard, like Blink-182 and then like the Blink-182 alternative band in the Christian music space. And so I knew that those things existed and one felt funny to me mm -hmm. compared to the other one. I was like, no, I want to listen to Blink-182. I want to hear them say that stupid stuff. Uh -huh. I don't want to hear this band talk about good things. Like right. it's fun when it's this. It's yeah. punk rock. It should be like, you know, whatever. And so the other thing felt odd to me. And then when I, when I was introduced into like contemporary worship music, I was like, well, I believe this. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me because it's totally different. It's a completely different everything, you know? Uh, you could just tell the heart was different. And so um, I was kind of deep in this depression state, and then that that started lifting me out of it along with, you really? know, yeah, just a community of people around me. Wow. And so, yeah, I, so I would say it was really helpful, and it was really hurtful. Yes, but you, but, but you have an association with Christian music essentially helping to pull you towards a better place. Totally. It seems to me like you have yeah. maybe like a, even a, yeah, you have an association with that even all these years later. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah interesting. And I, and I have found that the songs that connect most with people are usually ones that are helping them get out of a dark place. Yes. I think those are, in charts are funny cause they can, they can give you a big head and make you prideful and then the Lord has to humble you and that always hurts and is good. But, um, they do represent what things are connecting with people and more sure. often than not it's songs that are like helping people get out of the valley or at least turn their eyes to something you in know? the Christian music space or yeah. in general, just in the Christian music space. Yeah. Okay. Now general market, it's like, let's turn your eyes to something that's awesome. And yeah. Yeah. Now you said something earlier that sort of, <clears throat> I think, I think made a little bit of, it also made something clear to me that, I'd like to see if I heard it right, but are you saying you, we were talking about music and the emotions that it can sort of provoke and the types of music and the vibe and that type of thing. And yeah. I thought I heard you say something along the lines of like, there's going to be two things that are sort of denominators or common denominators with Christian music. One, the lyrics are going to be sort of, yeah. you know, Christian. Yeah. But then two, what the, the emotions, the music is going to be seeking to convey or yeah. provoke that's going to be another or a second sort of through thread or commonality yeah. among Christian music. Is that yeah. what you said? Is that true? Is that I mean, I, way to say that? I feel like that's true. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't think everybody feels that way, but I do think there's something to be said about reverence in, uh, in the sonic space as well as the lyrical space. Like how, how can we, um, if we're going to call it Christian, like, how do we do that in a way where it is is reverent? Um, and if you're talking about Calvary, yep. it shouldn't be a four on the floor, like dance hall yep. kind of anthem, yep. right? Like it should be a little somber and yep. then triumphant. There, like there's a, there's a certain emotion that goes with that type of a song. Yes. You know, and if, if you are um, just trying to use this like hyped track, to then get this really emotional, deep theological point across. I just don't, I just think there's, that's a weird thing to do. Makes total sense. To me, it just doesn't work. It's like, man, you know, you, you know, I don't know. Well, what stood out, here's why I said that, because if it's okay with you, I would just like to be honest, because that's always yeah. the better way to do it. But I sure. listen to very, very little Christian music. Totally. Now, what I would like to have from you after we're done with this conversation is for you to be like, hey, dude, here's a couple albums to check out sure. or here's some artists to check out. Cause yeah. I feel like I would trust that totally. And, and, um, but there is a subsection of Christian music that is, um, historically some of the most popular. And it's like, I've tried different bands mm -hmm. in that subsection of Christian music. Yeah. 
and it's just, just I just can't do it, dude. Like it's hard mm-hmm. to. I just <laughs> totally. I mean, I can, you know. I mean, yeah. I can sit through it. Yeah. It's just I don't gravitate towards it. I get it. But there's a lot. It it all. Some of it sounds the same. Yeah. And I wonder if it's like well because whatever this subsection is that I'm talk referring to, like they're yeah. all trying to convey maybe basically the same yeah. emotion, which is not a knock on them at all. It's just, yeah. I wonder if that also explains because yeah. like different songs have different lyrics or whatever, but yeah, there's just kind of a, there's a, there's a subcategory of Christian music that, um, well, I think that I just, I, I have a hard time listening to, but is it, an, is it Andrew Peterson? Yeah. Yeah. It's Andrew Peterson with, he had, um, forget what album it was but when i when i started listening to his music some of his music a couple of yeah. years ago i'm like oh well this is like this is legit you know totally it's good music and i i think i think i could boil all that down to one word and that's money mm. i think um we watched the jesus revolution movie the other night we've been wanting to watch that it's really good yeah i mean really it's good? really emotional and it's on netflix right I think so. Yeah. Like not, is it on Netflix or Apple TV? I can't remember. We rented it. I, I think it yeah, was Apple I, TV. I think you're right. Let's find out right now. Let's Google it. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, we watched that and it was a really beautiful, sweet reminder of how the whole thing kind of started because that was really the birth of the Christian music industry. Really? Yeah. It was just a bunch of hippies who were like kind of writing songs that fit like their hippie vibe. And it was like about Jesus, but it was kind of hippie. So pre that, there would have been hymns. That's it. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's why it was so hard to reach the hippies because there was, I mean, a big part of it was that the service just didn't, uh, you know, at all, like, draw them in. You know, they wouldn't have wanted to go because it's very liturgical and Uh high church and, you know, just everyone's sitting there and reading from the hymnal, whatever. Mm -hmm. So they started writing songs to just, like, really reach their people. And so there's something really beautiful about that, right? And I think you see that in like the ministry of Paul and like how we would go and he would speak one way to the Gentiles and the moment, you know, you see that. So I, I think that's helpful in a certain way. Um, but then what happens is it's like, wow, this is working and we're drawing in a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I think we could record some of this and then we could sell that. And then, oh, that worked. Well, let's do more of that and more of that and more of that. And then you get CCM. Yes. Which is just a lot of labels making a lot of money. And I think there are a lot of good people working in these organizations, but a lot of them are not run even by believers. Hmm. A lot of them are owned by parent companies in New York or LA or whatever, Hmm. and they've got a bottom line. And so that starts to affect the decision-making process of everybody downstream. Of course. And that ultimately leads to, you know, 17 year old artists getting signed because they've got a big TikTok following. They don't know anything about life. They don't know anything about doctrine or theology. And they're writing songs that are informing the, di- the doctrine and theology of the church at large. Because in my opinion, the largest denomination the church has is the Christian music industry. Hmm. It's the most reach. If you think about the access that these artists have and these labels have to people's ears, like it's just, I mean, it's, it's yes. remarkable. The, the chart that you read, I mean, that's, that's millions of people being reached and that's what makes it like your top whatever it's because you've reached that many people in that set number of weeks or whatever Mm -hmm. and so you've got you know talk talk through like that kid so that kid gets signed he's 17 years old he's like good looking has a cool voice big following on tiktok labels like oh my gosh we gotta i mean that's gonna blow up it's gonna be huge like let's just piggyback on that thing and all of a sudden all the decisions are being made based off of the the success rate and so it, it gets really dicey. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know what the question was, but I started talking. That is interesting. I did. I never knew the Christian contemporary Christian music industry basically started in the, in the sixties with the hippie movement. Totally. And before that, you basically would have had, there here's, was a, here's the thing though. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, like, wasn't right. Well, wasn't rock and roll kind of born in the sixties too? I think I don't know because now I'm thinking there was more music kind of born in the sixties. I think a lot that like any from the like twenties to the sixties, a lot happened. Yep, like a lot of like blues, jazz, like swing, all, yep. all that kind of stuff, and it all just kind of morphed. Um, but what's really crazy if you look at historic music in the church and you think about like composers like Bach and Beethoven and all these people, like 
a lot of that was influenced by faith. Hmm. And what they did is they wanted to make masterpieces that would stand the test of time. And, and they didn't mess around. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't famous in their day. You know what I mean? Like they, it became something. And now it's like, if it's not happening right now, it's not worth it. And I've gotten into the headspace of like, man, if I spent the next 50 years of my life and I wrote two songs that were worthwhile, that would be great. Hmm. And, and unbelievable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that'd be unbelievable. But I think what people do is they settle with the idea of like, man, if I can make money and, and produce mediocre content, Mm -hmm. that's cool. Yes. You know, certainly. And that's why you don't like Christian music. I think that's exactly right. I think you hit the nail right on the head. And the thing is too, is it's not just Christian music that's doing that because there's a whole lot of other music that I don't like also that's probably <laughs> totally. trying to accomplish that same thing. Exactly. It's just that also happens in the Christian music space. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it so, happens It happens much more in the Christian music space because in the general market, um, people are, are um, encouraged to be indulgent artists, to find themselves and to make it their own. Like, exp- like that's the encouraged in that space mm-hmm. in a way that it's not really encouraged in the Christian space. It's like, if you're writing Christian music, here's the confines of it. Right. And I think they actually have the wrong confines around it. You know, it's like, as long as it says something about God, you can put any track to it and we're going to, you know, blow it up at radio. It's gonna be great. But like in the, in the general market, it's like the weirder, the more yeah. unique, the better. Cause it's rare and it'll, it'll blow up. It'll be awesome. You know, like that's why bands and like artists are, just so much better there because they're encouraged to find their artistry. Okay. You know what I mean? So why can't that happen in the Christian music space? Um, I mean, I think it's that copycat mentality. Okay. You know, it's like the, I want to be a version of a Blink-182 or something like that. And it's not them right now, but mm-hmm. you know, it's like, Oh, you know, the weekend is so cool, Yep. you know, or whatever. And it's like so many, I've had so many people come in and reference like Drake songs and I'm like, what? Uh, in this song that they want to... Yeah, they're to like, record. yeah, I heard this Drake song. I want to do something like it. I'm like, why? Oh, sure. What? What? I mean, that's yep. about the cross. That sounds good. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> I think that fits. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's like a it's like a 400-pound man in like women's skinny jeans. Like it yeah. just doesn't... It's like why? That they don't sense. go together. I heard... This was either a former pastor when we went to church in Mount Juliet or this is like some dead now Christian author. I don't, I do not know where this came from, but the idea is the somebody idea, somewhere. Yeah. It was either like a, yeah, it was either like Charles Spurgeon or my pastor, Mount Julia. I can't mm-hmm. tell which no, but um, they said, we don't tell lies about God. We sing them. Mm. And his point was mm-hmm. some of these song lyrics, actually, even with some of the hymns, mm. I mean, I know Emmanuel where we both go to church that they, they do, they will change lyrics mm-hmm. or not sing certain, mm-hmm. if it's like, that's not right. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, uh, just as an example, this isn't the best example, but it's an example. We, the, this was just this past week. They were referencing some Christmas song about, you know, Jesus in the manger, never crying or whatever. It's like, yeah, you know, I think Jesus probably cried. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, now that's a sort of an innocent little one, totally, but there yeah, are yeah. stuff yeah, sometimes yeah. in My Christian theology songs, about Jesus crying as a baby is, is wrong. Yeah, no, yeah totally. exactly. Where like, yeah, even this, sometimes even in hymns was like, Ooh, yeah. I, well, I, I wrote a, so the thing that I just did, uh, just came off of recording, um, my course for studio.com about songwriting and uh, I wrote a song called the word of God it was just an idea that I'd had it was based off of the Matthew um, 7 if you build your house on these words of mine and then tracing his word all through like redemptive history so like the word of God at creation the word of God given in the law to Moses the word made flesh we couldn't uphold the word so the word had to come he fulfilled the word the law and prophets all that stuff so it's like it's from the dawn of creation, the word of God was there all the way to the end at the trumpet sound and, and now he comes back. And so it's just this kind of like historical redemptive thing broken up into three verses with the chorus. And one of the points that I made in the class is um, there have been a lot of songs written about like building on something or your firm foundation or whatever. 
And there's a line that's in so many Christian songs today, and I know the meaning of it. I know what they mean by it, but it, it'll say, you, you, you never let me down, or you'll never let me down, or you won't let me down. And I've had so yeah. many conversations with friends about that, and it's just like, that's just not true. Mm. He will not fail, mm. but man, I'm going to be let down. Because my expectations don't line up with the will of God so often. Yeah. And so my expectation will be let down. Like I might yes. pray for a miracle to happen and for like my mom gets cancer and then I'm praying for her to be healed and she doesn't get healed. I'll be let down. Yep. Cause I knocked, I asked, I, I was, I was seeking, I was, I was petitioning for it and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so if you're indoctrinating people with like, Again, it's like kind of subliminal, subversive, like wrong theology. It's just not helpful. And so it's like, man, that sounds good. And it feels good to sing with the, the you know, just the syllables and the uh, consonants and stuff. It's just, it feels good phonetically. But if you had just said, you'll never fail me, that yes. would make people a lot better off 20 years from now when they're really going through something. Yes, it'd be true. Turbulent. It'd be it would true. be true. Yeah, it'd be true. And there's something about truth. And it would be true without having to explain it. Yes. You know? Sure. Yes. You yes. wouldn't have to argue it. It would just be true. Yes. I love that. Now, okay, say more a little bit about the influence of music on one's emotions, state, psyche, yeah, et cetera, because I know there are some people would have this viewpoint that if you're listening to, you know, non-Christian music, particularly some of the genres that it can start to sort of, you know, almost like usher in a darkness or it's just, it's going to be not helpful, but also it could be worse. It could be like, it could be like, um, yeah, like kind of le leading you towards darkness or, yeah, you know, even maybe open the door for some evil that that's kind of an extreme, but yeah, that would have, that would have that viewpoint. And I mean, there are music, there is some music that I will listen to that makes me feel, yeah, I don't want, I don't like yeah, the yeah. way I feel right now. I'm, yeah. This is not putting me in a good state. Yeah. I like to listen to music that makes me feel good that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that is whiskey in a jar, you know, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, but I know some people would say, man, you listen to that song three times in a row and it's, that's not good for you. Mm -hmm. So can you say more about your viewpoint on music's effect yeah. on people particularly as it relates to christian or non-christian like is it the yeah. type of thing where if you listen to too much non-christian music it's just like it's filling you up with too much bad stuff and you need to clean that out by listening to more christian music <laughs> <laughs> clean it out man yeah i don't know i mean i can only speak from my own experience um and i as a you know young kind of overweight not popular kid in school who was like arty and didn't really fit in. I, I found like that I could like take my own kind of already blooming depression and then apply like these emo bands to it, you know, and they would like the, I, I just remember like even like an intro to a song would be the way that I felt that day. It wasn't a lyric. It was like, I want to go to track three. Cause that sounds like I'm just, I just, want to end my life right now like that's that's the state that I was in and and so many of those bands from back in the day I mean it's crazy like they would literally talk about like cutting and all like whatever and that's like the stuff that I was doing and so it was like informing me lyrically but it was also just informing me like in a very dark way to just hate myself and not feel like there was anything worth living for and and I, I mean I was in a really dark place and another example, I've got friends that have um, gotten really into like kind of emo hip hop stuff that's out and has been out over the past six, seven years. And, um, you know, I've had friends that have ended their life. And it's like, I don't think those are coincidental mm. that those things intersected that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like if you're listening to an artist who's just talking about like getting high all the time, you're probably going to end up getting high all the time. I, d I don't think you can really separate those two. You know, it's like you are what you eat. Like, it's just very simple. I mean, mm -hmm. I think out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and it's like, what are you taking in? You know, if your eye is, uh, what's the verse? It's like, if your eye is, uh, mess it's not messed up, but uh, if, 
your eye is bad, yeah, the whole body's if, bad. Yes. You know what I mean? If your eyes, yeah. You're, yeah. You said it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I do think there's there's an element of that that could apply. So I think it, it really has a direct correlation to maybe the emotional state of an individual. However, I would also say that um, you are not just going to be an alcoholic from from drinking alcohol. I think certain people are going to have a harder time with that. They're going to have the first sip and it's immediately going to be like, a oh, that's a thing, you know? And so I don't know that everyone feels the same way listening to the same types of music, but I do think it's really um, helpful to be in tune with your own spiritual state and just know like what, what are my kind of weakness places and, and what, yes. what will I not? Cause if I listen to that music today, like, I mean, I could find myself just kind of starting to feel sure. off, you know yes. what I mean? I could totally see that. And so it's like, man, I just might have like a, just a little like flag right there, you know? Yeah. And so I do think it's about just being aware of, of where you're at, it, just spiritual maturity and all of that. I mean, I don't, I, it's really amazing actually. Like I, um, I was in a terrible place and, uh, and I was like failing in school. I mean, I was just failing at life and playing a lot of guitar. Um, and I brought home a report card with like, I mean, it was like all F's and D's. It was so bad. It was terrible. And my parents were livid and they were so mad and, and they had no idea what I was dealing with. Like none of my friends knew what I was dealing with at all. I wasn't talking to anybody about it. Um, and they were just so mad and they're like, you're grounded forever. You're getting all the things you love taken away, you know, whatever. It was just extreme because they were so upset that I was just failing in school. And, uh, I was like, they are not going to get it unless I tell them what's going on. Like, cause the school thing, like I, I can figure, I mean, I'm a smart individual and I can figure things out and like, whatever, like I was failing in school cause I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with life. And so I wrote them this long letter and I was just like, here's everything I've been carrying for the last two years. Like all of it. I didn't realize at the time I was, I was confessing. I didn't know that that's what that was. I didn't have language to put to that, but I wrote them this long letter. I put it under their door that night and then they woke up in the morning and they read it and they just came in and like just bear hugged me and just loved me back to life, you know, but literally from that day forward, like writing it out, putting pen to paper and saying, here's, here's everything that's going on. I mean, it was like a switch flipped. It was crazy. Really? I literally woke up like a new human it was unbelievable. Isn't that something? I mean, just like healed of depression. <clears throat> that is really something because it's either Psalm 32 or Psalm 34. It talks about when I kept silent, I kept yeah. myself, my bones were yeah. rotting within me. Yeah. When I brought it to light, I, I, I got healing. It got yeah. healing. You know, it's basically yeah. more or less what it was, what it's saying. And that combined with, just how often the Bible does talk about confessing, yeah. bringing things to light, yep. not hiding them, getting it in the open. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a truth. It's like, this is the way that we're designed. Yeah. Like there's almost a matter of factness about it. Like yeah. when you bring things to light, it's like, just bring it to the light, just bring it to the it light. It loses all its power. Yes. It's not scary anymore. Yes. Totally. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this ties in. Yes. When you acknowledge it, this ties in. This was, I don't know, this is half a year ago, maybe even a little bit less. Yeah. It felt like we had some issues in our household that we just weren't. We wish it was different, but we weren't addressing. And um, we were, we were listening to some Jordan Peterson at that time because there's certain states that you can be in in life where some of Jordan Peterson's message is like mm. helpful, more helpful some yeah. in certain states than maybe sometimes. And I heard him talking about this. He was given a lecture somewhere and he was talking about this book. It's a kid's book. And, and so we bought it on Amazon just to read it. But the idea yeah. is this kid comes down for breakfast one morning and he's bringing a little pet dragon the pet dragon jumps up on the table while the kid's eating cereal. And the, and the kid's like, hey, mom, look at my pet dragon. The mom's like, no, dragons don't exist. 
So then, you know, then there's lunch and he comes back with his pet dragon. Now the dragon's yeah. bigger and he's like, look at my dragon. The mom's like, no, dragons don't exist. Well, it got so big. The dragon like filled the entire house, and was walking around the city, carrying the house. And the mom is still like, no, dragons don't exist or whatever. And anyhow, there's a point in the story where something happens. Mom, like, yeah, that's a freaking dragon. <laughs> and it just immediately shrank down and became a nice little basically kitten again. Yeah. The whole point of the whole story is that when you address things that that takes away their power. Absolutely. So we literally made a list. It's probably still in my Apple notes, I guess maybe of like the dragons that we feel like are in our household. Yeah. And what was very interesting about it, I kid you not is we made this list. We talked about it. Marianne and I, we didn't bring the kids in on it, but we did read in the storybook and yeah. we did talk about, this as a principle of life, et cetera. Yeah. But just her and I looked over the list of things that we thought were kind of dragons in our household. And we didn't come up with a plan on how to fix them or whatever. And honestly, right now, I don't remember exactly what they were. Yeah. I don't even know if I can remember one of them. Like That's it just, funny. when we made the list, it just sort of lost its power. Totally. Very interesting how that, how that works. Yeah. But it's like based on biblical, well, I guess God's design. And then the Bible tells us how this is supposed to work. Yeah. So it's it's cool to hear that you made that list. How and then the, the then that kind of the, its power went away. How old were you at that time? Gosh, I was like maybe fifteen, something like that. Yeah. And what caused you to get into that? Because that's a bad time to be dealing with depression. Totally. I mean, I don't know. I I I, I met some people who were dealing with similar stuff, and I've always had. Um, compassion for people and I've always wanted to help. I'm like a helper kind of people. I mean, anybody I meet, I'm just trying to find ways to help them win and whatever. Um, and I, I remember meeting, there was one girl specifically who was just like really in a dark place, like way darker than I was in for sure. Um, and she would just like tell me all the things she was dealing with. And, and I open, I was like, you can open up, talk to me, whatever. I was like trying to be a counselor at 14 years old. Hmm. Not a good idea. And I think like in a way that was sort of like a Brit, like it just kind of like pushed me into feeling some of those thoughts and, and I, I couldn't um, handle like, okay. I couldn't handle it like hearing other people's things yeah, maybe in like a way. Yeah, it was like an empathy overload or something. Yeah, it, yeah, it was kind of that. And then I was already just, I, I mean, I was just not cool. Like I was not a cool kid. I mean, I, 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 tr I really tried to like fit into different like groups and whatever and uh, I just didn't, I, I was kind of bullied and I mean, I just, I didn't have a great experience in public school <laughs> Wow, to say that the least. Sucks. Yeah, it was, it that was sucks so bad. It's, it was terrible. Yeah. I mean, and I'm like very optimistic like today. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, like I said, it, it really did change overnight, but I was like, I was happy go lucky before that. And then I kind of realized, wait, like I'm not cool and I don't have that many friends and whatever, you know, it was just kind of embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of overweight, you know, just the whole thing, just awkward teen years. Well, what I love about this is that this is one of those, and I think there's a lot of them where kids who are not successful yeah, in, uh, or popular, that was, I didn't yeah. mean to say successful, um, kids who are not popular in say, you know, middle school, high school wind up being very successful later on in life. I did like, not peak early. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> totally. but I'm telling you, like, this is your experience, but I'm yeah. also saying this is common. Yeah. I think there's something to this. Totally. And I, it, it, and it's kind of, in a funny way, biblical suffering leads yeah. to glory. Like, I do think there is a, there is something about the hard that um, produces something great. Absolutely. And I think one of the takeaways is probably multiple. Well, first of all, freaking kids need to be nice to everyone like yeah. this is you know there is still bullying happening and it's absurd like come yeah. on this has to this is yeah that is no way to treat anyone so that yeah it, that needs to to stop but i think another takeaway is like if someone is in in middle school or high school or, or, or maybe even college yeah and they are super popular mm -hmm. and they're listening to this my suggestion would be Listen to what we're saying, because also just how what 
what happened was the unpopular kids later become successful. Mm -hmm. It's also very, very common if yeah. you peak in high school yep. or college, you will not be as suc successful later totally. on. And I don't know why that works out like that. Yeah. But, but I, I think, think there's a trend here. So if you're like yeah. young and you are like the most popular, yeah. just steward it well. Like I don't know if you should like try to be unpopular, but totally. just steward it well because – it is very common for people yeah. who are younger, who are popular, to not be that successful later on. And yeah, I don't want to, totally. you know, say success just in the terms of, like, financial or whatever. Yeah. But that is a a way. To, a way. Yeah. That's yep. one of the things you can be successful in or not. So. Yeah. I think it's like, man, if, if things just come easy and everybody likes you all the time, you never, yeah. you never really have to work hard for anything yeah and then you get into real life and realize oh it's, shoot it's really the real hard. world doesn't just give you everything like no. maybe you had gotten in your school days and then totally what? yeah absolutely yep. um what do you think is so impactful or timeless or beautiful about music i mean like you know in, in terms of, like, the things that I enjoy most on this earth, I mean, you know, I'm almost 40, so what do I have, another 40, 50, 60 years? But in a few more decades, like, I'm going to be dead, my body's going to be under the ground, my bones are going to be, you know, my skin's going to be rotted, whatever. It's over is my point. Yeah. But right. What a beautiful visual. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. But right now, I'm alive. Like, we're here. You yeah. know, this is cool. We yeah, can yeah, talk yeah. to each other. We're living and yep. we can converse and learn. And totally. You know, it's it's really something to be alive with these people who we're alive with right now. Mm -hmm. But one of the um, the things that I enjoy most is, like, things that I do with Marianne. I mean, she's my yeah. best friend. I love her. She loves me. Like, it's like, yeah. you know, any experience in life is just if she's not involved with it, then it's just not going to be quite as good as if she was involved with it. Totally. And the things that I like enjoy most with her, of course, we're married. So sex, of course, food and music. Yeah. I mean, like those are top three, like totally. with my favorite person in the world, those are top. There's something about music that's so powerful yeah. and beautiful yeah. and life changing. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, infinite in some way what mm -hmm. is it about music that's so that can be so beautiful or impactful what do you think it is i have no idea but it really is i i think um i think you you see biblically um that there is singing in heaven like you you see that around the throne, you know, they're, they're singing like, holy, 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 you know, all like, I, I do think there's something in God's design where that's, that is a permanent piece in some way, shape or form. And I, I think he's given us, because I, I think you could also say like, where does the song come from? I don't just go like, I'm going to, I'm going to write a song today and like, I'm just going to, all right, I'm going to have an idea. I don't do that. I'm just driving or cutting the grass or taking a shower or whatever. And like, I'll have an entire chorus of a song just hit me. Melody, lyric, I know what the band's doing. I used to wake up and get so frustrated when I was younger. And, and I would literally, like, I would be dreaming. And just those few moments right before you wake up, I would hear the most incredible like completely orchestrated, just beautiful arrangement of a song that I'd, that I'd never heard before. Like lyric, every, I mean, just like everybody's doing everything perfectly. And I don't know where that comes from other than the Lord. You know, I mean, we don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything else like that. You know, I don't think we visualize like what a food is going to be like when we cook it. I mean, we try things and we've learned and we've experienced, but you can't, you can't learn how to have an idea. You can't learn how to be inspired in that way. And so I think, I think there's something um, that is, is transcendent and maybe eternal, like you said, about music. Um, I don't know what that thing is other than to say that I, I really feel like, I mean, one of, one of my friends has said, we're not songwriters, we're song uh, receivers. <laughs> uh-huh. 
you know, because it's just like, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you'll you refine the idea and you'll write into the thing that you've gotten. But that first fruit idea is not something that you came up with. Yes. You know, it's like something that is given to you, like an idea. Totally. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and my biggest songs have all been that. I mean, just like fully. I mean, it would just be like an idea that comes to me and it's like it writes itself. I mean, today I have the number one song on Christian radio. And it's been number one for like six weeks. And it is The Lord's Prayer by Matt Marr. And um, we used to go to a church called Fellowship Bible Church down in Franklin. And one of the things that we did like four years ago as a church is we all said the Lord's Prayer at like 3 p.m. every day for a month. Our pastor was just like, hey, we're going to study the Lord's Prayer. And I, I would just encourage everybody in our congregation to just set a timer or, or set an alert on their phone every day, 3 p.m., um, because it will most likely interrupt something and you'll probably be around some people and it will, it would just remind you to say it. And so like for me, I did that for a month and it would interrupt like writing sessions and, you know, coffees that I'd have with people or whatever. And I'd just be like, Hey, I'm doing this thing with my church. You want to say the Lord's prayer? Oh. And we would just stop and we'd pray it. And, and I started thinking about like, how can I get my kids to know the Lord's prayer? Cause it's hard when they're young. I mean, they would have been like, four and two or something at that time. Like it's real hard when they're young to teach them a long kind of section to memorize. Um, And I was just kind of thinking about, I was like, man, it'd be cool to put some melody. And I was in the truck on the way home from work one day. I had actually set that um, alert on my phone for like three months after I just kept it going because I loved it so much. It was such a great like kind of interruption in the day. And, um, and I was driving home and I literally like, I just turned on voice memo And I sang the entire verse, an entire chorus of that song within like 30 seconds. And there's one little thing that changed in the chorus, but it's it's not really like changes the integrity of it or whatever. But the entire thing came like just that quick. And, uh, and I showed Matt Marr and he was like, this is amazing. Oh my gosh. And he came to the studio the next day. We literally, I put a click track on. And I held down an A note, just a note, not even a chord, just a note. Because he had like 10 minutes. He was in and out. And he was like, I know you don't have a track. Can I just sing it over? And I was like, okay, I put a click track on. And like, eh. So that's all he had was just a tonal reference. Sang the whole thing down. And in the middle of it is like, I got the bridge. I got the bridge. I got the bridge. I was like, okay, cool. And I put him in the red and he sang the bridge in another 10 seconds. And that's the whole song is literally verbatim scripture. Wow. And it's incredible how that just happened. There was no like, hey, let's sit down and write a song. Let's really try to be song craftsmen today. You know, that was just a direct like influence, I believe, of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. in saying like, hey, these are my words. Mm -hmm. Let's get them out in front of a lot of people. So then later he would have went back into the studio to record what we would listen to now, right? Totally. Yeah, we did that. I mean, it would have been maybe a year later or something like that. Okay, so when he recorded that, you were sort of solidifying the lyrics. And then as he was singing, you had an idea for what the bridge should be. And then he recorded that. He did. He did. Yeah. He had an idea for the bridge. So he did that. Yeah. And then that's how that song came to be. That's it. What's the song called? The Lord's prayer. Just the Lord's prayer. That's it. Is it on YouTube or it's, I think so. Yeah. Like, can we pull it up? Sure. Yeah. That's it right there. That's it right there. That's it. Play that thing. Can do, are we going to be able to hear it? Kobe? We headphones off. Now go. Yeah, so this is where we tracked it at this uh, at this house in Hendersonville. Can we turn that mic on over there? Or no. I mean, that's it. It's, it basically starts with like. Oh, there we go. This is Roy Orbison's old house. Okay. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. Give us this day. As we forgive the ones who sin against us. 
bridge. This is the bridge. He ha- he wrote it like in ten seconds. Cameo there. Oh, you were? I was there for a minute. Yeah, okay. This is a, this is a sneak peek. Nobody gets this. I'll show you what it. I'll show you that truck that day. Yeah. You want to hear that? Yeah. Okay. Will it pick it oh, up? Oh wait, wait, wait. This is we're about to hear the recording. This is the original. Of what you recorded in your truck. This is yeah, January twenty ninth, twenty twenty one, in my truck. Jo- Jan- Jan- Let me wrap my head. Father, let your will be done. Father, let your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. On earth in my heart. Just mumbling, you know. Father, let your kingdom come. Real slow. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. And I'm figuring this out in real time. Give us this. Nope. Give us. Nope. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us. There's the melody. Forgive us. As we forgive the running and advance us Mumble. against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we change that. Father, let your kingdom come. But that's it, you know? And it's like you take that. Dude. You hold a note and you have a click track and you just refine some of the melody and you've got it, you know? That's freaking awesome. Isn't that dude. crazy? That is freaking awesome. But the thing about it that's so wild is it's like, to to your point, like, what is it about music? I don't even know where it comes from. Yeah. That's the what is it about music. It's, it's completely outside of us, mm-hmm. which is so incredible. And I think to TJ's point, that's why all music is like Christian music because yes. God owns it all because yep. it all comes from him, you know? What was that date again you recorded that? Uh, January 29th, 2021. 2021. Uh huh. So yeah. two and a half years ago. Yeah. When did the song come out? Uh, that video came out 11 months ago. Okay. Yeah. And currently, that song is the number one song in the Christian music genre. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. That is awesome. Last dude. week, I, th- I it was last week or the week before. So it's been number one for six or seven weeks or something like that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think it was like you know, like the billboard thing or whatever. It's like across all charts, it was number one. And it's really hard to hit them all at one time because okay. there's like AC monitored and billboard and oh, like there's wow. a bunch of different charts yep. for different stations that report to different formats. Yep. And so it's really hard to ring the bell kind of across the board. Uh huh. Um, I haven't done that in a, a minute. Wow. Yeah. That is really cool, man. Yeah. There was, um, see, that's great music. Yeah, that's great music. I need to, I need to learn more about more where that stuff is. Totally, yeah. that I can, I can listen to that. Awesome. Um, yeah. there was a stretch in my life that was, it was like, um, you know, six to twelve months there. It was, it was real tough. Where there was a few months within a year. Let's put it this way, where it wasn't anything to do with the marriage or home or anything. It was work related, but it was really grueling. Yeah. Very hard. I mean, aside yeah. from losing my dad when I was 10 years old, this was wow. the hardest time in my entire life. It was hell. And there was a s- stretch in there, a few months, where 
I didn't even know what to pray, and I would just pray the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. I'd be standing at the urinal, taking a bathroom break, just yep. praying the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Walk into the office, just praying the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Taking totally. a shower, praying the Lord's Prayer. Just wanting yeah. to have, like, will to go start the day in the shower, yeah. just pray the Lord's Prayer. I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. The Lord's Prayer is to see that in song form. Yeah. That's that's really cool, man. It's it's remarkable um, that I, it hadn't been done in that way. Hmm. I was I was blown away by that. Cause mm-hmm. I was like, for sure, somebody's done a Lord's prayer. Like that's happened. Yeah. You know, it's like iconic. But um, surely there is, right? There's I mean, I I think there there hasn't been anything that's been really like kind of that, that rose to sort of the yeah. level of not ignoring a lot of a lot of times when you hear that song or like an interpretation of that song, it's very solemn. And it's yes. kind of like this introspective thing, which is actually a whole nother conversation. I actually, I love how that production turned out. Um, it feels very celebratory and, and really beautiful. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. yeah. But what's really funny is, and, and we've got a version of it releasing next week um, that is like polar opposite in vibe. And so okay. it's, it's, we're calling it the Sunday morning version. And so it's like a very reverent track. Um, it's, it's more like, you know, 10,000 reasons kind of esque, mm-hmm. I would say, treatment. And then Taya is featuring on it, who's mm-hmm. part of the Hillsong crew or whatever. She's just awesome, utterly remarkable as a vocalist and uh, just carries such a sweet spirit in a song. And so she's on it. We did a whole new treatment of it. And it's, I'm so excited about it because that's the version I wanted to record first. Oh, that okay. was the one I really wanted to do. Um, and it's funny, I, I'll tell you why. So uh, have you ever read The Hiding Place? Corey Ten Boom. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So it was a play, right? It was a play too. It was a yeah. book and yep. Totally. Yeah. Just incredible story of faith in like the most dark environment possible, you know, concentration camp and her whole family's getting killed off and it's just terrible. Um, and my wife was in the middle of reading that and just in this like deep spiritual place of just wrestling with the Lord and like just wanting to lean in and trust him and all, all these different things. And it was it was just a really like trying season in our life. Um, again, not our marriage or, or kids or anything. It was just like just situational stuff that we were dealing with. And so um, so she's reading that. I'm writing this song, and she had heard my demo, which was real upbeat or whatever. She was like, "This is this is great. This is awesome." <laughs> and we recorded this version of it. And she came by the studio, and she was like halfway through the book, and I was like, "Babe." check this out, check out what we did. And I pressed play and it finished. And she was like, I hate it more than anything in the world. And you're an idiot for doing that. When people say the Lord's prayer, they don't need to be, they don't need to be doing it like that. (laughs) They need, they need it to be reverent and you need to read the hiding place. I mean, she is like so brutally honest and critical and it really gave me pause. And I actually didn't fully agree. And I don't think that I fully agree now with the fact that it should only be that. I really think there's a beauty in the celebratory kind of joyful there expression is, of, yeah. of the Yeah, I see what there. you're saying, though. Yeah. But she's like, you're you're not there to party. <laughs> you're there to, like, bend to the will of God and, and see him work in your life. Like, I just, I think there's such a beauty in having that, like, just, no, you're an idiot. Why wouldn't you think about it this way? What about the people who are suffering? What about the, you know, like, she's just considering all these, like, actual situations of life, right? Not everybody's just like partying all the time and like, man, we got to record at this cool place in Hendersonville, you know, yep. um, like our drummer played with John Mayer. Whoa. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's fun, but I think you forget the point a little bit in yeah. that process too. So I love that both are going to exist because I yes. think they both should exist. But this one that's coming out is really like, it's like the true and better <laughs> oh, version. Cool. In my opinion, uh-huh. I think it's just night and day. It's just awesome. I'd play it for you, but I'd get in trouble. I say so we can't get a sneak peek. We can't. That. I don't yep. think we can get a sneak peek. But, but you have heard the completed version. I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And when is it coming out? Uh, the 2nd of June. Oh, cool. Yeah, so right, right around right, the corner. Right around the corner. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is we're recording this on May the 25th. <laughs> this will go out next Thursday, right, Kobe? Yep. So on June 1st. So, yeah, the day after this comes out. Sweet, dude. Well, maybe we should play it. Well, I mean, it'd be the day before. I don't know. Oh, the day before. Never mind. We yeah, can't do that. No, no, no. Do that. Then I would, Hopefully I would, yeah. every, <laughs> yeah. the label would hunt me down. You don't want to have that, but no, yeah, no but it's sure. going to be incredible. And I love that both are going to exist, but it is yeah. like, I mean, I value my wife so much because she just doesn't butter me up. Yeah. She'll encourage the good things, but she will break down the bad things. Yeah. For sure. So valuable. Oh, it's so, especially as a creative 
mm. who's already just self-absorbed and thinks every you know it's like i made it it's beautiful don't you love it what does yeah. she think about this version that's coming out the tay one mm-hmm. oh she's like she, she will listen to it for the rest of her life she loves it yeah this she, is the version that she thought should have the song 100%. should have been originally yeah. but has she warmed up to this version at all i think she has yeah yeah okay. she has I and our kids so, love it that's a great song no and our kids love it and people are singing it and and families are singing it because it's a because it's expressive and joyful and it's yes. so true and it's a it's a I actually think it's really great. And I think she thinks it's really great too. I just think we both think the other one is better. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's the thing about that's actually I like I love this a lot because that's that's one of the things about like the way God works is like yeah. even in suffering there is joy. Yeah. You know, it's like Yeah. Yeah. There's not I mean, I guess that's why it's God, you know, there's nothing yeah. else like that. Yeah. And like, there's no other way, like the way of God either, because this is, this stuff is so like counter, like it seems like it's contradictory. Yeah. You know, totally. But it's, there can be joy and suffering, yeah. you know, you yeah. know, your to your question earlier about like, why does the music carry the weight it carries or whatever? Um, I also think it's, it's really amazing that like in the middle of the Bible, you have a book of songs you know, I mean, it's just, it's ingrained in what it is to be a believer is to sing and not because you have a great voice, but because you have a great God, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think, I think there's just, man, there's like so much there. And even in the Psalms and how things are expressed, like the emotions and, and all of the trials and, all, you know, I just think it's incredible that we have that as a resource to go to. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, no doubt. Yeah. I think, um, I think you're exactly right about these songs or these ideas coming from someplace outside of ourself. Yeah. Yep. Because I know there's there's some like there is some questions in like secular circles like where do ideas come from? Yeah. Um and mushrooms. You probably get some great ideas on mushrooms. I mean, I I wouldn't know, but I'm saying that's probably where this is. Like, yeah. Let's just go on a journey and we'll, well find them. Yeah. Well, yeah. It might work. I don't know. Um, but even then, it's still outside of yourself. You know, like totally. there is another yeah. source. Like yeah. I think we can probably all resonate with this. Yeah. But I think this is why ultimately God doesn't need to get the glory for anything good that is going to come in yeah. our life. Yes. Whether that's a massive business success mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. a massive song or whatever, yeah. like an idea with a kid that's maybe struggling with something and then it mm-hmm. really helps. Like yeah. those things do come from outside of ourselves. They do. Absolutely. There's something out there, you know, and I think we would both agree. It's like, it's the, it's the divine or it's, it's God, you yeah. know? Um, I remember too, I mean, just speaking to like business and success and stuff like that. Like I remember being a, a young, I mean, I had like toured around in a band for a few years and I'm like 20, 21 this is before we moved here. I was leading worship at a church in Richmond, Virginia. We had just gotten married, my wife and I, and um, I'm like kind of running this nonprofit thing and she's doing hair and some admin work and, you know, we're just working and young newlyweds or whatever. And, uh, and I was just, it was the first time in my life where I started actually reading the Bible. I started reading my Bible because I met my wife. That's really what happened. She just totally rocked my world. Um, And, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm reading my, my Bible, and I've, and I've loved music my whole life so far. Uh, and I've written songs, but they were really bad, and they were just kind of like emo and whatever. And this was the first time in my life where I was like, oh, no, 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 I have something to write about. And uh, the first song that I wrote was from the Hebrews passage about Christ being our anchor. Um, that was like the first song I wrote in the headspace of being like, I want to write songs for the church, you know? Mm-hmm. Um and I started sending songs to people that I knew in Nashville. I had a great buddy who's high up A&R at Capitol at the time and um, another guy who's like, you know, Grammy winning producer, writer guy. And so I was like sending these like terrible songs. And I was like, what do you think about them? You know? <laughs> and I remember one of the guys um, being like, man, you know, just uh, keep doing it. And, you know, like if it's meant to be, like they'll come to you, <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> But it's kind of that thing of like, you just, you just don't know. And then all the little things that happened, all these intersections of my life that led to getting invited out here to work with like a really successful producer and writer and kind of him take me under his wing. 
like all of that stuff that happened. I mean, I didn't manufacture it and it, I don't think it really even came from any of that stuff that I was pursuing. It was, I just got an invitation one day. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, I remember you. And, uh, would you want to come like work with me a little bit? Who you gave know? you the invitation again? So this is a guy named Chris Stevens. No, but was it a songwriter? So he's a producer and a, a songwriter. A producer and a songwriter. Yeah. Contacted you and said, hey, come to Nashville. Yeah, he had recorded my old band. And so gotcha. we knew each other from, from gotcha. those days. And okay. Yeah, and we had just kind of connected creatively. And he, and he had a guy that was kind of partnered with him in a production level, and, and he was going his own way. And so he had a space kind of on his team is what happened. When was that? So we moved here in February of 2014. So are you saying it as late as February of 2014, you were not, um, pardon the term, I want to say successful in the like, Oh, no, I was very unsuccessful. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. No, I had never opened Pro Tools a day in my life before the day we moved here. Like, I knew nothing about it. That's nine years ago, dude. Yeah. That's not that crazy. long ago. We moved to Nashville in 2014. It's wild. Yeah. In 2014, so were you... Okay, how long up until that point were you trying to write songs? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> or I starting or yeah. Whatever. I mean, I, I I found like an old like notebook of stuff that I'd written when I was like nine. You know, just like lyrics uh, okay. and stuff. So I mean, I was always interest. into music, and yes. yeah, and okay. I and I didn't realize. I mean, I had done a bunch of work on like my high school band's record, like on this little recorder that my dad bought me, and like I didn't know that it was called producing. Okay, I was just like, well, we have to record it. We don't have any money, so like, uh -huh. let's buy a box that does the things, and I'll press the buttons. Okay. You know, and I had like dear sweet friends who would show me stuff about like audio back okay. in the day. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I I didn't do anything good. So like this was every everything was terrible. Yeah. So 2014. So then when was the first kind of like outbreak for you? Yeah. Yeah. So it. I would say. Um, one of the great things about working with Chris was. Uh, and I had it described to me this way. I did a joint venture publishing deal with him. So it was a publishing deal with him as partly my publisher and then Capital as partly my publisher. And when you do something like that, you know, imagine there's 10 rungs on the ladder of the music industry and everybody starts at like zero and then you're just tr trying to climb your way up. And if you attach yourself to somebody like that, you're kind of starting on like rung number five. Okay. And so it's like everybody sees you through the eyes of their success. Okay. And uh, that's great if you show up and it works. But you can fall really far really fast if uh -huh. you don't prove yourself. And so I'm this green, naive, young dude coming to town, newly married, whatever. And uh, and I'm just like, you know, I get in and my first day. I remember my first day in the studio. Uh, and obviously, like, he was like, do you know how to work Pro Tools and Apache Bay and Outboard Gear and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah. Dude, I know all that stuff. I'm so good at all that. <laughs> like, I'm really good at it. And I've done it a lot. And totally lied. Oh my and I get there the first day and Michael W. Smith is in the studio and he's cutting a vocal and Chris is like, hey, you want to run it? You want to run the vocal session? I mean, you're here. He's here. I'm here. Let's, you know, I'll just sit on the couch. And I'm like, yeah, I would love to do that. How do I make it go? <laughs> How do I make it go? Is there like an on button that I need to know about? Oh my goodness. And literally like in front of Smitty. And, and this guy who's just hired me. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to do it, but if you give me like two key commands, I will do this right now. And I cut his vocal that day. Wow. I mean, I just was like, I, I just knew that if I knew enough to get by, I could figure out the rest. Mm -hmm. And I spent the first three months of living here at the studio. I didn't even have a room to work out of. I was in the lobby of the studio at this little like makeshift table desk with like a, an iMac that I had borrowed from somebody and I was YouTubing, like, how to be a producer. <laughs> what is compression? How do microphones work? Like, just all of it. Like, I didn't in know. In the studio? In the studio. I'm wow. in the space I'm supposed to be doing this professionally at, learning how to do it. And everything was just happening in real time. And Chris loved it. Because he was like, you're the exact person I want. I want someone who is hungry, who has the ear and the instinct, because you can't teach those things. Like, taste, instinct, ear. You can't. You can't like give that to somebody, mm -hmm. but you can give them tools to use. And then if they have that naturally, then you, they're unstoppable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I was hungry. I had instinct. I knew like, I knew what sounded good and sounded bad. I just didn't know how to make it sound good. <laughs> you know, Yeah. I could hear it though. 
And so like, I just YouTubed a bunch of stuff and I was like trying to figure out how to work it all. And I mean, yeah, it's just incredible. Wow. That's wild. So man. it was like, yeah. So how soon after that did you have like, Oh yeah. The outbreak. So, yeah. 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 So, um, which such sounds so negative. When did yeah. you have the out? It's like the, yeah, when did the we virus say spread break, break out? <laughs> you know, like when did the monkey come to your back door? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I just fed it a banana. No. Um, so my first like breakout thing that happened, it was kind of a few things in a row. So because I worked with Chris, one of Chris's main and dear clients is Toby Mac. And so, um, within a couple months I had met him and been hanging out with him or whatever. And we moved in February and Chris decided to go to Oregon and, and just basically take the summer off in June. So June and July, he was in Oregon with his family. And so Toby was mid record at that point in time. And Toby's like, bro, what am I going to do? I got, I got to record these songs. And he's like, I got a guy. I, he's really good. <laughs> I was really bad. He's like, he's really good. And he basically just talked me up. And like some of my first work that I ever did was on Toby's record. And I ended up writing like four songs for that record with him and producing a bunch of them with Chris. And so I like, I actually like kind of cut my teeth on his record. That's the first thing I did. And so this is even crazier. I produced and I mixed a song on that record. I mixed it. I was the mix engineer. No well, business mixing a song. I was going to say, for that, you need to know how to run equipment. No. Right? Not really. I mean, a yes. sound engineer is the one who knows how to run the equipment No, the I mean, best. you do. No, you do need to know that. But also, if you have ears, okay. like if you know what sounds good, sure. and you can ask a lot of help from a lot of people. Yeah, and sense. basically, I was like, Chris, what plugins do I use? Mm. You know, and he just showed me the things that he uses, and he's like, here's how I do it, whatever. And I had like a template, and I was like, okay. Kind of went from there. That was like my starting point, you know? Um, And so I did that. And then Toby's got a label called Goatee Records. And so he's got, he's got tons of artists on there. And so he was like, man, this guy's cool. We're both from Virginia. We just kind of had a natural little thing. Um, And so he started getting me to work on all these artist projects for his label because I was just like young new guy or whatever. And so I started working with a girl named Holland and we had like, I think three or four number ones together within that first couple of years. And then my big, big breakout thing was with a guy named Ryan Stevenson, who um, is, is still signed to go records today. Um, and at that point in time, he had written a song called speak life for Toby that had blown up really good, but he never had like a big hit for himself. And I, I, sh- I certainly didn't have anything to write home about. And so him and I just kind of got paired up as like, Hey, you guys are both kind of like wild cards. I don't know. It might work. It might not. (laughs) And we just hit it off that day. And and I ended up producing his full record. Oh, wow. Within like a couple of years of living in Nashville. And so then I think in like in 2015, I don't remember the exact timeline, but at some point in time, we wrote a song called eye of the storm. And that funny enough, I had pitched to him I had written a chorus and I pitched it to him because he was on tour with Matt Marr at the time. And I was like, Hey, we're friends and you're on tour with Matt Marr and I want a Matt Marr cut. Can you show this to him? And, and we can all write it together. Like help me help you yeah. type of thing. And he was like, totally. And then he listened to it and he was like, Hey, actually I want to cut it. And I was like, shoot, I want a Matt Marr to cut it. Lo and behold, we ended up writing it. We wrote it in an entirely different way than I ever would have written it. It's like a, like a, it's his version of what a modern hymn would be. So this, the verses are very story, just about all these diff- difficult things in life. Okay. And uh, and then the chorus is just this big kind of refrain. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. It's just, it's just a big like kind of, I trust you. Mm-hmm. There's no resolve in the entire song. Mm. It it never resolves other than to say you're in control, and that's the resolve, which is really unique in the Christian space. Usually there has to be like a bow on everything. Mm-hmm. So that song goes on to be, it's the last song that we do for his record. We just produced it like however the heck we wanted because we already had the singles picked for the record. The label was happy. We were just like, let's just do one for us, man. So we did it and we turned it in and we had this like outro, like hip hop weird thing at the end that was just like him reading like a Bible verse, like, yea, though I walk through the valley, you know, whatever. And it's just like very like <laughs> intense. And it was just cool. We just wanted to do something cool. Yeah. And so we loved it and we turned it in. We're like, hey, just put it like last track on the record. Like, you know, some, and a couple people will hear it, whatever. And the label's like, this song is amazing. And Toby's like, this song is a hit. 
And so they like, they just changed everything around. They're like, let's take it to radio right now. So we took the outro off <laughs> and wow. rewrote a couple of the lyrics just to, just to be a little more palatable. We had just written them very like, like for us, you know, mm-hmm. rewrote a couple of lyrics, put that song out. We, I mean, me and him are 50, 50 writers on that song. It was just the two of us. We actually invited Toby to write that song with us and he played golf that day instead, wow. which is really funny. Um, but that song went on to be a 16 week number one song at oh Christian radio. It goodness. was the biggest song of the entire year In with like 15 or 16. It was 15 or 16. 15 I don't, or 16? I don't, yeah, okay. I don't remember which. Good and grief. I'm like a nobody and he's like a kind of nobody. I mean, he had had a couple things work, but nothing worked really big for him. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's been huge for both of our careers. And so wow. that really catapulted me forward. Cause okay. it was like, okay, you were Chris's guy and that's cool. You know, you did some Toby stuff with Chris. That's cool. Yep. And some other things that came through the Chris kind of thing. But then this was just like me and this guy yep. that nobody expected anything from either of us. And so for that to happen and be successful was a really big kind of moment for both of us. Yeah. Because it kind of like affirmed like they are good at what they do, you know, or whatever, yep. you know, you can trust them. And so that started kind of wow, everything. So cool, dude. Yeah. So now you you write songs and you produce. Yeah. Like, do you produce songs that you don't write? Do you write songs that you don't wind up producing? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I produce probably 80 to 90% of what I write. Okay. So if I write it, usually I produce it. Yep. Um, just kind of by default. Cause it's like, if they've written it with me and the artist trusts me as a writer, they're like, Oh yeah. And you're a great producer. Why don't you do it? Cause you know, the vision and heart of the song, you know? Um, and then I, I produce, probably 60% of what I produce is stuff that I've written. And then I'll, I'll produce okay. about 40% other stuff that comes okay. from other people. I just recorded five songs with the Gettys on Monday and two of those songs I helped write and three of them I did oh, not. Cool. Yeah. And so that's kind of a, a good gauge. And recently you had um, <clears throat> recently, I mean the last couple of years, actually, I don't know exactly what happened. They, they invited you to go someplace with them that they yeah. don't invite many people to. Do you not even know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I think TJ mentioned this or something. TJ's yeah. like, yeah, this dude's legit. The Gettys <laughs> have him looped in. They, That's great. Not many people get on this list or whatever. Yeah, the, the Gettys are, um, they're one of the only kind of organizations within our space that operates this way, but they keep it very exclusive. And it's not because they think they're awesome. It's just because they're really careful about letting other influences come in. Mm-hmm. They just want to retain the integrity of what they do. And what they do is write hymns. They don't write, contemporary Christian songs. They're not writing for radio. They're not writing for any sort of other commercial success or anything like that. They are writing songs that the church will sing. I see. And if it doesn't meet that expectation or that bar, um, they just don't want to do it. Makes sense. Know? It's like, Hey, there's a lot of people to do that. That's great. That's not what we do. And so they're not a typical publisher or a typical label um, or a typical artist in that way. Uh, they've got a very narrow focus and, and they're just hyper focused on that and they've got tons of vision for it and it's great. So I really respect it. Um, but yeah, they've, they've had, I don't know, over the past 10 years or so, they've had probably six to seven, eight writers maybe in their whole fold. And they've just kind of all been together that whole wow. time. Um, and then, uh, they brought me in, actually, I don't, I don't even think they brought me in. I know a radio promoter, um, named Josh, who's just a dear friend and we've done a lot of work together across a lot of different artists and stuff. He heard a song from the Gettys because like their manager or somebody showed him it. It's called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And they were like, hey, do you think there's any chance they could work at radio? Yada, yada, yada. Long story short, Josh brings me in to reproduce a new version of that song. And so I did that. And before I did that, part of like the, hey, do we want to work together thing? I think Keith wanted to vet me a little bit. So he's like, come to my house. We're going to have a glass of wine and talk and get to know each other. Okay. Which is really great. And yeah. so it was fun. I just went to their place and at the time they lived in Green Hills, but. Um, this was almost two years ago and, uh, yeah, just met up with him, talked, kind of told him who I was. He told me who he was. We hit it off really well. It kind of was like a a good connection. And I think it like for, for him to meet someone in the kind of commercial pop CCM music space, who's like reformed and passionate about theology Mm -hmm. is just very rare. Mm -hmm. So he was like, what do you mean? You care about that? What do you mean you believe that? You, oh, 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 okay. He's like, he's like seeing what you, th- what you, oh, totally what you're made of, kind of what you. Oh, and I wanted the same thing with him. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, it was like it was we were feeling each other out for uh-huh. sure, um, and so I think that kind of sparked his interest because I'm like, yeah, I really am passionate about things sounding incredible, 
but they have to be like right and true. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to just do that. And like at the expense of, you know, integrity of a lyric or doctrine yeah. or whatever. So anyway, we just started kind of getting familiar with each other. Uh, I did that song. I produced that song shortly after that. I mean, we had kind of talked about like maybe doing some other things or whatever, but they're real exclusive. And then shortly after that, the guy who originally produced the original version of Christ, our hope and life and death, his name is Ben Shive. I was like getting files from him one day for that song. And we were like, Hey, I've heard of you. Yeah. I've heard of you too. Why haven't we ever written? I don't know. Let's do it, bro. And like, he lives right down the road okay. too. Yeah. And so, uh, we got together one day and we wrote this song called where thou leadest me. It's like real, like old timey kind of him. And, uh, and we just hit it off. He's so sweet. He's so talented. And, and we just really hit it off. So he, I did this demo of that song. And then uh, Ben was in Ireland with the Gettys last June. I'm about to go again in, in a couple of weeks or in a week, actually. Oh, cool. So last to year, Ireland? yeah, last year at the same time, they were getting to Ireland and Ben showed Keith the demo of what I had done. And I literally get a call from Keith on my birthday, June 6th. And he's like, hey. It's like three in the morning here. And it was like nine here or something like that. He's like, oh, it's like three in the morning. Can you get on a plane tomorrow? Can you be in Ireland tomorrow? And I'm like, I mean, I don't know, man. Let me like talk to my wife. <laughs> you know, like, like that's tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, hey, babe, Keith invited me to Ireland. Like spur tomorrow. of the moment tomorrow. And she's like, happy birthday. See you later. And she was like, just enjoy it. I, I had taken the week off anyway, just for my birthday. And, uh, and so I just, I, Literally, I got on a flight the next day, went to Ireland. It takes a while to get there. And then I spent the last three days of their writing retreat with them over there. Uh, and Where Thou Leadest Me is actually coming out, I think, in a week or two, because uh, we did it live at Sing Conference last year. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah, and I got to sing it. So I'm, I'm actually oh, on it. Which cool. is, I got to sing it with Kristen, which is yeah. really an honor. Wow. So that's coming out soon. So that was like, you know, the fruit of that labor from way back then. Mm -hmm. But we wrote another song called Rejoice on that writing retreat, which is a song that they released previously and I just produced. And so, okay. yeah, it was really great. And it was like, they've never done that. Wow. Like the, like just bring a random guy. But I think he was like, okay, I've, I've gotten to know him. I kind of know his heart, where he's at, you know, theologically, all the things. Ben really likes him. He's like, okay, if you fit with Ben and I kind of like you, I think you'll fit with the rest I of see. us. Yeah. yeah. And that just started like a blossoming relationship. Okay. So now we're like actually in more of a formal business arrangement together. Um, we're working on this hymnal for Crossway together, or, or it's a whole team of people that are doing that. Um, that'll release in a couple of years. And so there's, there's lots that we're doing and again, going to Ireland, but I meet with Keith once a week. Okay. Um, sometimes we'll skip a week, but it's just, just kind to of, stay in touch or are you writing. It's or? like song sparring uh, okay. is what we do. Mm -hmm. And so like, First two hours is like, show me all your best ideas. Mm. Second two hours are like, all right, I'll show you my best ideas. Mm. Have a glass of wine, tell each other what things we hated about all the things we wow, heard. Wow, that's cool. And then trying to write songs that way. I see. And one thing that's unique about their whole system uh, is that they will take years to write a song. I mean, it will take years. And they'll refine and refine and refine and refine and refine. And they'll get so much opinion from worship leaders and different, you know, theologians and people they trust and just be like, do you think this could stand the test of time? Whoa. Yeah. And that's how they write. So it's very, very different than everything I've ever done. Cause the Nashville way is like, you got four hours, you just met them mm -hmm. and we need to have like a demo by the end of the session. That sounds like it could go to radio. Mm -hmm. That's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. You know, yep, no doubt. Yeah, that's, dude, congratulations, man. That's really Thank cool. You. I mean, it's safe to say you're not a struggling or a starving artist. <laughs> I mean, I'm it's intermittent fasting, but I don't know if that's the same. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that it's like, um, I guess, any other sort of art form where the top, probably, I don't know, what is it, the top, certainly 1%, but top 5% does extremely well, and then yeah. there's a whole lot of people that yeah. are putting in a lot of work. Totally. And, and maybe there, there's going to be a, you know, a, a financial reward in the future. But yeah. I, I would assume that the Christian music industry would be exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I but, think you see, uh, again, just speaking of the compassion that I have, like I see a lot of people who have a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I'm always trying to get my friends songs in front of people and stuff just because it's like I don't have to be the guy to write it, you know. Did you have to get a, how did you get to Ireland? Did you have a visa ready or don't you need one to go there? or how I that No, I just passport. Yeah, I had a oh, real? oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. 
It wasn't like a, I wasn't working. You know, right. I don't need a visa. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But it was quick. Yeah, dude. Super that's fast. So quick. Yeah. Wow. It was bananas. What else do I want to talk to you about? This was great, dude. I really enjoyed this. So fun. Yeah. Anything else you want to cover? Man, that's that's. I think that's it. Here's the, here's <laughs> the last thing that I, I do want to ask about this because there's something. Songs are trademarked. Is there any sort of like a patent? Obviously, that's not the right word, but is there any sort of a patent like around a copyright? The song? Yeah, copyright. Yeah, the copyright has to do with not just the words, but also the way the notes are. Yeah, it's the music too. Is that correct? Yeah, it okay. is, and it's gotten um, it's gotten a little more strict, probably okay. for well, the better. <laughs> what stands out to me is just how like you know the Gettys are taking such an amount of time to make a song because one that's once that song is done and it's packaged and it goes out there. Yeah. It's like something that is forever. Yeah. That. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's at a much, 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 much different or smaller level or in a different category entirely is this conversation. Mm-hmm. Like you could be back on again next week and we could try to cover some of the same stuff. It's not going to be the same conversation. It would never be the same. You know, this is like a, it's like a point in time that we're never going to get back again. Yeah. And songs, that's what I think is so cool about music too is, yeah. I mean, it's just notes and timing and words yeah. that you mix just the right way. Yeah. And they can live forever. And they can live forever. Yeah. It's really kind of cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, you know with the Gettys again, it's it's when they're thinking. The only thing they're comparing what they do to is like historic hymns that have stood the test of time. Sure, you know they're not comparing it to the top charts or they don't care that I have a Matt Marr thing out. Like Uh that's not what they're thinking about. You know, they are like okay, uh, doxology or like you know, um, come thou fount or you know they're they're like looking at all these ancient. Or not ancient, but historic hymns mm-hmm. that the melody structure is just so brilliantly crafted that it 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 just becomes a part. It's like Mary had a little lamb. Like it's it's hard to write Mary had a little lamb. Mm. You know, that's hard to do because the, it's so simple mm. and it's so like the the confines of that melodic structure and rhythm structure. It's just a lot of repetition and the note like the range is very small. And that's actually really hard to do to limit yourself in that way and write something that's memorable within those limitations is super hard. And so, yeah, it's just, it is interesting. Uh, if people want to listen to some of your music, is there a place they can go or just search Brian Fowler yeah. on Apple Music? Or how can we send people to hear your stuff? Well, if you want to listen to the three things that I've personally put out, you can look up my name on Apple Music. You, you, I don't know if you'll like it or not, but you can check it out. Um, and then I will have a uh, studio.com slash Brian Fowler link live in a couple of weeks where you can actually go and take a songwriting class, basically shadow me for two days. Oh, cool. And so that'll be available too. Um, and then uh, I'm going to have um, kind of in association with, with that, Spotify is putting together like a songs written by Brian Fowler playlist oh okay that yeah yeah because i was just thinking how could people yeah. find songs that you've been a part of writing yeah. or been a writer on yeah you need a playlist for that because i yeah 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 so otherwise my, you don't search like apple music and be like you wouldn't find right. it that way yeah, yeah you wouldn't find it that way yeah so my my publisher essential music and then um spotify are teaming up to put out basically like a songs by brian fowler playlist oh, sweet so that'll okay. be a thing that you can search and then you can see and i think it ranks them from like highest stream songs to lowest or something oh, like cool. that. Or maybe How like, soon is that coming out? Uh, it should be in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think that'll... me when that comes out. I will, yeah. It should come before. out a little bit before the studio.com thing comes out because they okay. that one is going to live within that website as well. Okay. So, yeah. I want to listen to that song. in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. 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 You said he has a lot? He has a lot. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Is this a lot? Was this abnormal or is it just... It is a lot. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that I've been working on for a long time. Yep. You know, so I think I'm, I'm just kind of getting to a place where like I'm able to see them all get released. You know, like the same conference thing happened in September of last year mm-hmm. and that song's just about to release. Okay. So that's been in the works for months, you know? Yep. Yep. But I want to listen to that Spotify playlist. So if yeah. you think about it when it comes out, text me. 
All right. And then people can also check you out on Instagram. Or is it just Brian Fowler on Instagram? Brian the Fowler. Brian the Fowler. It's B R Y A N. Brian the Fowler. Yep. On Instagram. That's it. All right, dude. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. This dude, was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, brother. See you guys. Try to catch me howling at the moon.